Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here at Flights of Foundry. And my name is Fabio Fernandes, and I'm here to give you the presentation about writing post-colonial, sorry, <laughs> writing post-colonial science fiction, a primer. So uh, I will share my screen for I will give you this presentation. So uh, bear with me. Uh, just a moment. This is all very new to me, I'm sorry, but I think I will do it okay here. Oh, okay, let me do this for you now. Okay. First, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about me, not too much. Uh, in case some of you are interested uh, or came here just for the the um, the title of the the presentation, but don't know my credentials, so I'm telling you this: uh, I am a journalist. I'm from. I'm was born in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I live in São Paulo currently, and I'm a journalist and a professor at the Pontifícia Universidade Católica de São Paulo where I teach in the courses of journalism and game studies. I'm also a translator, and I did uh, the translations of many science fiction books like uh, Neuromancers, No Crash, 2001, Ancillary Justice, Brave New World, uh, Clockwork Orange, uh, among many others. And uh, I was also an editor for a, a few years. I, 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 I co-edited three books. The first is uh, We See a Different Frontier in the UK, 2013, uh, Vapor Punk 2 uh, in Brazil, and Solar Punk with my friend Francesco Verso in Italy uh, last year. Uh, I'm also a writer, and I've been writing for three decades in Portuguese and for a decade and a half in English. And I published uh, two years ago uh, a novel called Back in the USSR, which I'm currently translating to English. And uh, less than a month ago, I launched my first story collection in English called Love on Archaeology by Luna Press Publishing. Uh, Francesca is also in the dealer's room if you want to have a chat and if you want to buy the collection. And uh, by the end of the year, I will be launching a steampunk novella called Under Pressure with my friend Ian Waits of Newcomb Press in England. So uh, that's just for you to know uh, where I come from and uh, what my credentials are. I was also of Clarion West class of 2013, where I have uh, amongst my instructors, the awesome Elizabeth Hand, Neil Gaiman, Joe Hill, Margot Lanigan, Samuel Delaney, and Ellen Datlow. And let's cut to the chase, shall we? What is post-colonial fiction after all? Essentially, every fiction written by authors for former colonies, but also fiction written by authors who belonging or not to former colonies reflect upon colonization and its consequences. That is, okay, I'm from Sao Paulo, I'm from Brazil, and I, can I write about, can I write a space opera? Can I write about alternate histories? Can I write uh, adventure, supernatural noir, and still be a post-colonial author? Yes, yes, that's, that's one of the things we will address rapidly here, because uh, some people tend to uh, understand that you are only a post, you only write post-colonial fiction if you address directly the consequences of colonization. Uh, it's, it's very important that you do this, but every time you write from the point of view of some other culture that's not a, a, from the colonizers, you are doing post-colonial fiction. And here's the thing. Suppose you who are listening to me are from the US, uh, UK, Europe, and you want to write stories about uh, other cultures. 
Can you do that? The too long didn't read answer is yes. Yes, you can. That's no big issue with that, as long as you follow some advice. So how to cross that bridge particularly? Let's do this. First thing, what do you know? What do you know about the thing you are going to write about? Let's call it this A. I'm, I'm uh, following here uh, some instructions given to me by uh, my former instruction and friend, Samuel Delaney, who was always uh, telling us that uh, a, a story should go from A to Z. Uh, maybe you can, uh, don't need exactly to do that in the straight line. Maybe you get to meander a bit, but you must have a starting point and a finish line. So what information do you know about the people or the culture, the historical period you intend to write about? And second one, maybe we can call it Z. What exactly do you want to write about? That's what I'm referring about in the last slide. Do you mean to write a, a post-colonial story? Oh, okay, let me talk about oppression of the colonizers. But you belong to a colonizer culture. Are you sure you, do, you want to do that exactly in this fashion? Maybe you can write other things, other stories. I'll give you a couple of, of examples here. Uh, about this. But before I give these examples, write what you know. This is a, a famous phrase uh, regarding writing. Every writer, when doing a workshop, have, has uh, listened to this advice. But um, it's a tricky question because every now and then something appears and says, don't you can't possibly write what you know all the time if i'm writing a story in outer space or in the distant future how can i write what i know and i have a, a an answer for this as well uh you did that you you are seeing here that i just did a schrodinger move and uh, it's it's a good advice and it's not a good advice okay because yes First, why is that still a good advice? Because of the effect of reality. I'm not sure if you are familiar with the French philosopher Roland Barthes, who wrote about this, giving examples of stories by Honoré de Balzac, for instance, uh, Roman Gary, and three, uh, two or three other uh, French writers when they were writing about different historical periods, and they wanted to make sure their readers would understand and get immersed in the narrative. So they did their best to write all about the surroundings of the characters. In order to achieve this immersion, maybe you, you can research a lot, okay, but you should try to write in this point, in this particular case, about what you really know not exactly uh, with the setting, with the scenario of the story, but the emotions of the character. For instance, you are writing a story about a particular character who's uh, going uh, to avenge the death of his father. You all know the story, right? Hello, my name is Nigo Montoya. You murdered my father, prepare to die. We, we, we love to we love the story, we love uh, uh, The Princess Bride, but okay, this is written much as a as metafiction, as a satire as well, but suppose you want to write about uh, a character in search of revenge. Do you, do you have to have your own father murdered in order to step in this character's shoes? No, you know that, but you can think of maybe small petty things. Oh, I want to revenge of that bully in the fifth grade uh, because he, he beat me a lot. And you try to get this emotion and okay, I can talk about vengeance. I can talk about that time I cried because my dog died 
and I can transfer this emotion, this very true, honest emotion, to other other character in a small, now yeah, different, smaller, different, different circumstance. You can do this. At the same time, though, you don't write just what you know. That and that lies the 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 wonder of science fiction or fantasy. The sense of wonder comes from writing something different. But make your character relatable to the reader. And the only only way you will go to do this is uh, becoming, you become the character. You bring the character, some characteristics of yourself, of some people you know around you. And then uh, two examples I'm going, I'm going to give. The first example is uh, Lawrence Watt Evans' story, Why I Left Harry's All Night Hamburgers. This is a very interesting story because it's not a post-colonial story, but it talks about something very close to post-colonial stories. The, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to give spoilers here. This story is 30 years old. And uh, this tells the story of, uh, of, of, a, of a guy, a, a, a white young man that's going to work um, as a bartender in this, in this uh, all night joint. And uh, he is in the night shift and every night he sees before him uh, several very strange figures parading, people in the, uh, different outfits uh, and people who resemble aliens, though they are not aliens, they are humans, they speak English, but uh, they pay, uh, but sometimes their, their English is, is very different. It's heavily accented. And okay, this this guy, it, he doesn't know anything about America and about that particular city in which he lives in. But he's not a stupid guy. He notices that, and night after night, he starts to talk with these people until one night, one of these uh, customers tells him, oh, here's the thing. Uh, Harry's All Night Hamburgers uh, is exactly on an interdimensional nexus. Uh, each of us come from an alternate reality. And, but Harry's is the best hamburger joint in all realities. So that's why we keep coming here. And they, oh, oh that's awesome. But at some point he's, he decides, I, I don't want to stay here anymore. I don't want to stay in East, my native earth. I want to go with you on, and live big adventures. And one, one of them uh, talked to him, this, but why do you want to do that? Your universe, uh, your earth is very interesting. I come from a devastated earth. Um, most of my friends here come of, uh, of uh, alternate earths with uh, less resources than yours. You know what? Maybe you should know more of your earth before starting to think of visiting ours. In the end of the story, uh, he's narrating from uh, uh, another point in time, and he's telling his story to someone. And the final sentence is, and you, what brings you to Tibet? That means he really went out for adventure in our, our reality. I don't, don't know if it's, if it's, if it's the, the moral of the story, is, uh, if it's a moralizing story, of the kind of, oh, you should never leave uh, for other countries. But uh, here's the thing. He was uh, advised to know more of uh, other cultures in his own planet before starting to get to know others. And I think that's a very sound advice. The other story uh, I will have, I will ask you, Permission, I will stop uh, sharing and I'll share again here um, another thing. This story, I won't give you spoilers, but um, I don't know if he's watching us here, Dave D. Levine. Um, I will, I want to share the screen of, oh, okay, here. Discards. It's a wild card story uh, the Seattle White Levine wrote. And uh, I can remember um, it's, oh, okay, he published this 2016. I think that one year or two years before, he asked me to be, uh, beta read the story because the story is, takes place in Rio de Janeiro. 
And let me tell you, it's an awesome story. He did, he did his homework. And he's a full-blooded American. He does, as far as I know, he, uh, he doesn't speak Portuguese or maybe a bit of Spanish, but not Portuguese. And we don't speak Spanish here, we speak Portuguese. And, but uh, people tend to treat us, in fact, all foreign cultures as exotic. And that's not what David Levine did. He respected our culture. He told a, a very moving, very compelling story. And uh, you should read that story. Uh, especially if you are uh, from the US on, or the UK or um, uh, Anglo, Canada, Anglo, uh, sp English speaking country. I think it would be, it would do wonders for you. And these are the two examples I, I wanted to, to give you. Um, let me share the screen again. Okay. All right. The thing is, people, the way you write about the world reflects the culture you were born into. You can change where you were born. That's that's pretty much a given. But you can't turn the odds in our in your favor. And I would like to to present a, a, an example that may may sound strange to some of you, but uh, follow me on this. Every one of you have already saw lots of movies, TV series, you read a, more than a few books about alien uh, first contact with aliens. Most of them probably uh, talks about invasion. Every time we have a series, a TV series especially, and there are several films, Colony, um, Independence Day, um, Distant skies. I can remember this, this, this name. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm not giving you any examples uh, from the uh, English uh, speaking world because you have plenty. But uh, aside from one particular example that I will give you to you here, I really can't, for the life of me, recall one big, interesting example of aliens coming to Earth and not wanting to invade and colonize us. I think that's a, a very interesting fear that the colonizer has when he writes stories about aliens. Oh, we did a lot of invasions and colonization and don't, we don't want to do anyone to do this to us. And every now and then I like to talk to my students on the university about this and show, okay, but what about other cultures? What do you, what we, we stand on it? And so I would like to give you a few examples, starting with maybe the most famous of them all, Solaris by Stanislaw Lem from Poland in 1961. The book is 1961. Here is a still from the Steven Soderbergh's version which is not bad. Um, many people, many, many friends of mine uh, hate this, this, this version, but I, 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 I do enjoy it. I think it's too on the nose sometimes, but it's a, it's a good, uh, it's a good version. And there's of course the Andrei Tarkovsky, Russian version, Soviet version, 1972. Both of them are very interesting, even though uh, Stanislaw Lem had a, uh, really didn't like the, the Tarkovsky version. I, I'm not sure he uh, came around to see the, the Soderbergh version. But the, the book is this. There is a planet far, far away, which is uh, comprised by a living ocean. It's a sentient being. And so far, human, uh, human scientists had uh, this, this they have for sure that they are dealing with a living intelligence, but they cannot communicate with it. This living intelligence is confined to this planet. And here is a space station orbiting the planet, where for, for the book, I think they were there for two or three decades trying to study the planet, and they created a whole science called solaristics, meaning to explain the, the, what is Solaris? And they can't. He is very interesting because he's being very critical of academia 
and at the same time paying uh, homage to uh, this Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges, because he picks very uh, several, creates several types of titles of books uh, that uh, propose to uh, make you understand a bit more about Solaris. But it's very very clear that no book can explain Solaris, and their authors are totally lost about it. Totally clueless. They don't have the foggiest idea of what Solaris is. But one day, and here's the thing, they do a colonizer bit of uh, shitty behavior, pardon my French, and they uh, irradiate uh, part of the surface of the planet with X-rays. I, can't, I don't even know if that's possible. Okay, that's a, a story written in 61. So they irradiate it, and right after that, strange things start to happen. And uh, most of the people at the space, space station start to, start to commit suicide. And then a psychologist is called from Earth to go there and to assess the phenomenon. What's going on? Is uh, maybe the planet is causing this suicidal attacks? He'll find out that that's the case. That's really the case. Solaris is uh, to blame off, not necessarily, because we still cannot know what Solaris think. Maybe it reacts like uh, something that uh, human skin, they, maybe you put a, a re, an irritant and uh, the planet is trying to brush it off and trying to brush us off the, the surface or the orbit. So oh, get out of here. I don't want to, uh, I don't know what you are, but you are irritating my skin and I'm suffering. And probably is this, but the book ends on a cliffhanger and we will never, never know what it's about. I, I love this, this kind of stories. I don't know if you like those stories too, but that's an interesting thing to know because I think only uh, a man from Poland, from the Iron Curtain at that time would have written this kind of story. And the same goes to Roadside Picnic by the Soviet brothers Arkady and Boris Strugatsky. In 1972, coincidentally, the same year of uh, the version of uh, Tarkovsky's version. And this here is uh, still from the, another Tarkovsky movie, Stalker, based on Roadside Picnic. In this case, uh, in, in this is a marvelous story which has uh, lots of interesting uh, ramifications. Everyone who has read the uh, 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 Southern uh, Sovereign Cross, Sovereign Range uh, trilogy by Jeff Van Der Meer. Uh, that first book, Annihilation, was made into a Netflix movie. Uh, it's a, it, he pays an homage to Roadside Picnic and to Stalker, the movie. And here's another thing this man is a guide, as also known as a stalker, and he is guiding two men across the zone. The zone is a particular area uh, in the Soviet Union has, or, that has been affected by an alien phenomenon. Again, like in Solaris, scientists have been able to assess that, okay, this is really out, out, from, out, out of Earth. So, but what we can tell about this? What more? We don't know. Uh, everyone, most of the people who enter the zone die there or become insane. But that's not, that's no Cthulhu, that's no elder gods. Uh, and this this an ex, unexplainable phenomenon. Uh, the stalkers are uh, people that just manage it by sheer luck to get out of there alive in the first place, then memorize a route by which they can come and go without being harmed. Physically harmed, that means, because their minds probably already had already been warped by this phenomenon. Uh, and at some point in the book, I can't remember if the film stalker, there's this dialogue. I, I think that is this, this line of dialogue. One of the characters say, what if um, the aliens are, were just passing here and this zone uh, remains um, something of the, the waste, uh, as if they, their ships were cars, they were driving across a road and suddenly they, oh, okay, I don't need this anymore. Uh, and then they, they, 
throw their waste out the window and uh, uh, we are the place of their roadside picnic where they just throw out the garbage. We are waddling through their garbage. Maybe this is re the remains of alien tech that they had discarded and they don't even know we are here. They don't even recognize us as sentient beings. And that's another horrifying thing. But the indifference and the uh, inability of communicate. Next, next example. This, I think, will be more amenable to uh, English and American readers. Uh, I love Ursula K. Le Guin, too, of course. But this is another thing. Uh, uh, Ursula Le Guin did uh, do a, a lot of, uh, of good when she wrote about the, the Heinish cycle, because I don't know if you are, are familiar with the, the cycle, the story of the cycle, the chronology. At some point in the 21st century, humankind leaves Earth and makes contact with humanoids, really uh, very, very similar to us. And these, uh, they come from, they are the Hain, and they welcome them. So, oh, so good you are joining us now. Welcome, welcome back. Oh, what? How welcome back? Yes, because you are us. You are uh, uh, the galaxy was seeded by us billions of years ago, and uh, we still have uh, a few planets colonized by uh, seeded by by us, and we are uh, uh, having contact with them just now. And we, you are welcome to join, join our community if you want to. And here's the thing, humans, and by which he, she means Americans, always consider themselves the center of the universe. And now they know they are not. And these two novels, this uh, Left Hand of Darkness and World for World is Forest, show shows us uh, very harshly these realities. This, this first one, not so much because the, the character, the, the diplomat is going to the planet winter, but uh, they ha he have, has to reveal his own prejudices when he finds out that uh, the inhabitants of the planet uh, go for, for uh, the uh, kind of hormonal change, the camera, and they uh, change uh, genders. And at some point, the, 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 the human representative is uh, stuck in a mountain because of an avalanche. She's in a cave in the mountain uh, with uh, another representative. Both are male, but then the, the male uh, inhabitant of winter suffers scammer and becomes female. And then the, the human representative starts to feel very uneasy because he starts to have uh, to desire uh, the, the, the other person and he starts to asking himself, am I, uh, uh, is this okay? Am I liking her because she is her now? Or am I, uh, and I'm, I'm homosexual and, and I never knew that. And that's very healthy because the, the, the human representatives goes out of this experience and changes because he starts to, to, to think more and to immerse in the other culture. And okay, now I think I understand a bit more about myself, not that much, but it was a very interesting experience. And uh, here in the World for World is Force, which many are attributing these days to uh, one of the inspirations for James Cameron's avatar. And I tend to agree. But this story, I'm sorry, is much better than Avatar. Um, but it's, uh, I, I have to do a trigger warning for, for anyone who hasn't read it yet, because it contains uh, violence and rape on the part of humans to the aliens of this planet, which seems to us like uh, unevolved individuals. They are shorter than us, they are furrier, and they live in, uh, in communities uh, in the forest, which occupies practically the whole world. And they really, they are, most of them are military and they say, we are here to pick up the resources and take back to earth. And uh, we don't care about the, these aliens, but hey, they are the aliens, not the natives. 
and uh, one one human happens to not agree, and he calls a micro revolution there in the forest. Uh, it was written on Vietnam times, so uh, I think it's pretty much it's easier for Americans to relate uh, to the story. But it's very very important still today, all the same. Here's one of, the, my, of my favorite stories of all time, uh, the Shinozinesis series uh, that's currently called The Lilith's Brood by Octavia Butler. Uh, I think the story of Lilith Iapo, a uh, wonderful story, because she, uh, she, was, uh, she suffered a, suffers a lot. That's, uh, she's a woman in 20th century Earth, then we have a nuclear exchange that pretty much destroys the entire planet. But the story starts decades after that, because she was uh, on cryo sleep and she was being purged of the radiation uh, and by she was saved to Earth. The, the few millions of survivors were saved by the Oankali, uh, which were, uh, were a spacefaring civilization that uh, have huge living ships that roam across the galaxy. Uh, pretty much not saving, not much, not so much saving civilizations, but as absorbing them into their own. Then she is saved, uh, and unfortunately, she had a husband and a son which were die, died in the in the in the nuclear war. She wasn't resurrected. She was rescued by them when she was on the brink of death. And they tell her, "I'm we are sorry, but we couldn't save your husband and your son, but we saved you, and you were changed." And she was going to find out later in the book that they changed her DNA. They uh, gave her some Oankali DNA. And uh, they, they, they seem to be a very interesting uh, people, but they, are, they behave to us pretty much like uh, white people behave toward black people in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, or native, native Americans, native Brazilians, being condescended. We are white, ergo, we are better than you. Let's take you to civilization. And the Oankali do the same. We don't want you to hurt yourselves anymore. So we, we uh, exchanged some DNA with you. So now you are going to, uh, you can't display many uh, violent features anymore. You can feel rage, but you become severely ill if you try to act upon it. Also, did I mention you can't have sex between you anymore? You have to, a, ma a human male, a human female, and a, 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 a one can in the middle to process the DNA so you can have a baby. But Lilith became pregnant. A time, uh, some time after that, and she will have uh, some human DNA and some Oankali DNA, and she will bring uh, mixed a mixed race kid. And she takes time to to process this and to accept this, but she will become a sort of advocate for the Oankali without ever forgetting her own roots, and she will fight some uh, survivalists, American because she's American and she's living with a North American community in the, the living ship, and they are transplanted back to Earth, who was, Earth was also purged from radiation. And uh, it's a trilogy, and this trilogy is really, really interesting, because uh, the road of uh, good intentions, as a uh, road uh, is paved, no, road to rail, hell is paved with good intentions. Sorry, I got that right now. And, uh, Here's the thing, she is uh, incredibly talented to show us how you, we could do a first contact without, without an aggressive invasion, but an invasion all the same, an invasion by creatures who tell us, oh, we are doing the best for you. Don't, you don't need to worry. We are doing what's best. We know best and you know nothing. And that can be uh, really bad. But again, Maybe the only story uh, written by uh, uh, in originally in English language that I know of that I can think of uh, that really doesn't have any uh, any trace of uh, possibility of invasion is Ted Chiang's story of your life. 
maybe most of you have seen the movie Arrival, but uh, I'm referring to the story here, to the short story, which is one of the most moving stories I've ever read. I, uh, I every time I read it again, I, I, I cry because it's a it's a powerful story. And it's about the power of, power of translation everywhere. And uh, that's why I presented myself as also being a translator, because it's a very interesting thing to do when you are capable to understand other language. Um, I'm, I'm my original language, my native language is Portuguese. I wasn't raised in English. Uh, therefore, uh, I'm always worrying if you are understanding me, but I'm not asking this question anymore. Because I have some measure of years in which I am uh, doing the stocks and courses, etc. But it's all the same. Every time I, I write, speak in English, I try to think in English as well. And here's the thing. Maybe many people trying to, to criticize Ted Chiang because he used the, uh, the sapir Whorf hypothesis, which is pretty much done for. And nobody uses it for real in academia. But I think it's really, really good for using fiction. And one thing that has nothing to do with this hypothesis is that when you translate from other language, you really have to think in that language. And the translator in Chiang's story does exactly this. She became an alien, so to speak, because she, she has to be an alien to understand them. That comes with the territory, and language is a territory. Uh, I wish uh, uh, I, I, we won't have so many time here, I'm thinking about 10 minutes, and I would like to, to recommend other authors out there um, from several countries and identities, uh, Samuel Delaney and Izzy Shaw from the United States, Aliette de Bouda from France, but she's, she writes in English. Uh, all of them uh, here write in English. La Vichidar is from Israel, but he lives in the UK. Silvia Moreno Garcia, she's from Mexico, lives in Canada and writes in English. And Neon Yang, which was uh, my classmate at Clarion West, uh, they are from Singapore and they write in English as well. And all of them can provide a plethora of options if you want to understand other cultures without necessarily having to uh, be lectured about it. They don't lecture, they write narratives. Uh, Nizi Shaw wrote, for instance, an excellent story called Everfair, uh, 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 steampunk in the 19th century in, the, in, the, in an alternate Congo. Aliette de Boudar keeps writing beautiful stories about uh, intelligent ships, living ships, uh, and detective one in the, the in the culture uh, from the, the Dai Viet in the in the with Vietnamese roots, which I found I found really awesome. Silvia Moreno Garcia writes all the time about Mexico and Latin America, as well as La Vitidar, who has lived in many countries, including in the Isle of Vanuatu, and he loves to write about different stories. But he's always writing about the Middle East, about Israel, about uh, the consequences of uh, the Nazis, and uh, giving us powerful alternate histories, much more than I... I I have translated Philip K. Dick, but I should say that La Vitidar does a much better job writing about uh, alternate history involving Nazis, for instance. And Neil Young has also, is also with uh, three or four novellas right now, uh, the Tensorate series, which also leads with, uh, with mostly Singaporean and Chinese culture in, in, in the future. And it's a, it's a, it's a beauty to, to read. I couldn't recommend it more. And one question for you, uh, what about you? What can you create being a child of your particular culture? And what are your personal choices as well? Maybe uh, when we are uh, talking from a culture that pretty much culturally dominates the world, because let's speak the truth, I'm speaking in English, not in Portuguese. So the culture that dominates the world currently is the English culture. Uh, that's the lingua franca of our world is English, or at least the Western world. But uh, 
I, I've, I've talked to, I have a, 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 a many friends from the United States and sometimes I'm talking to a few of them and they, they say, but, 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 well, but, but my culture has nothing uh, particularly interesting, uh, has nothing uh, worthy uh, talk about, has, is not uh, exotic. So uh, in here is the thing where we draw the line and start thinking along uh, a new line of thinking. Um, we must understand this. Uh, the other is you. I'm talking to you all the time from another country, from Brazil, where, as I just said, we speak Portuguese. Uh, uh, if I wanted to show you my living room, I won't do that. But you see the same kind of chair, of tables, of, um, using a Dell computer. I have a, a Samsung uh, uh, smartphone and whatever so things you can recognize as being part of your culture as well, but the tiny things uh, are are not such as language. It's not a very tiny thing, mind you. But every time we are talking to other people, we must recognize this. We tend uh, uh, to call the others, the foreigners, uh, exotic, but they do the same to you. They can do the same to you. Maybe we don't do as hard because we, uh, we are more used to your culture than you to ours. You can speak Portuguese most of the time. Uh, you barely know what we do in terms of writing and series. Do we have right now two, two series in Netflix. You should, we should see, uh, 3% and invisible city, uh, one science fiction and fantasy. They're very good series. Uh, but there are so much more and we should learn this. You are always the other to someone else. This is not self-help garbage. You really are. You are the other. And so you should learn to not to use the word exotic anymore. I was, uh, reading a tweet last week, two weeks ago about how, uh, a person was saying, don't use the word exotic, but for things you may do, you may use those, this word. I don't agree. I really think you shouldn't use the word exotic anymore. Maybe, maybe, uh, sometimes I read about in the quantum physics. Oh, there is an exotic particle. Maybe, maybe you should do, keep using this in this context, particularly, but not, uh, not for things, not for fruits not for food, not for people. I'm not exotic. I am what I am and I am of, I'm in, uh, a native of my place as you are of yours. It sounds a bit corny, I know, but uh, it's the truth. It's hap it happens to be the truth. Even if I don't speak the English, I would like to speak as correctly as you use it. Uh, I'm communicating with you. It's not, it's not a Solari situation here. So we should, uh, we should try to learn more with each other in this respect. That's what uh, post-colonial literature is about in the end, uh, to communicate with each other. So, uh, if you ever want to approach me and ask, oh, may I want, uh, may I write one story? Uh, as I told you, the, the David Levine example, which I, a story I really love, you can do this. You can, you just can maybe uh, approach with respect. And here's one uh, final or next to final piece of advice to you uh, from Borges himself. The, what I call the Pierre Menard method. It's a uh, it's quote from Borges, which for his story um, about uh, Pierre Menard, author of the Quixote uh, in this fictional writer managed to rewrite the Quixote, but not rewrite into the 20th century. Uh, it was a satire on postmodernism that Borges uh, writes to us, explains to us how this Menard was acted uh, like if, if he was possessed by the spirit of Don Quixote and became Don Quixote himself four centuries later. And he wrote again, word for word, exactly the same text of Don Quixote, but his is better because he's writing with four centuries of difference. 
of course it's a satire it's meant to be comic but here's the thing when he talk when he tells us what menard really do no spanish well recover the catholic faith fight against the moors of the or the turk forget the history of europe between the years 1602 and 1918 be miguel de cervantes uh, it's it's a it's a uh, I don't know if you if you find the story funny. I I, I find it a lot funny, but uh, I I I think it's really interesting because if you want to write about the history of other people, learn to be respectful enough to uh, at least that one of your characters become one with this culture. It's not easy, but you can listen, you can read, you can witness, you can, you must always approach with respect. And whenever you are in doubt, stop and ask. Here's the thing that you should know. Nothing is, nothing should be forbidden as long as you approach it with sincerity and honesty. And I think, I think we're coming to the end, exactly one minute to the end. So I want to thank you so much and i don't know if you have any questions uh because i'm doing this you are watching this on youtube it's not it's not a a room uh i'm not sure if the if you have any questions in the comments i'm not seeing the comments right now if you have one i think i have one or two minutes to to answer something Uh, and if you don't have any questions, though, I'm finishing this presentation and thank you so much for you being here and goodbye. <laughs>